Welcome to the Barcelona Podcast, episode 188, brought to you by the Blue Wire Podcast Network and sponsor betonline.ag. It's Unmissable Opinions, brought to you by the most influential voices in the FC Barcelona community. I'm Dan Hilton, and I'm happy to introduce my co-host, who I would never have a vote of confidence against, Frances Tomas. <laughs> That's because no one bothered to vote for me or, or against me. <laughs> um, hola, Gules. Really, really happy to be here again. Um, I wish you're washing your hands and being safe and staying at home, etc., etc., etc. Great to be here again. So today we have been avoiding. For those who've been listening to the podcast recently, we've been avoiding talking about current events because I, we, Francis and I, both decided and t- spoken about how what's going on in the world with the pandemic and the way that the world is is unified on a front and transfer rumors and all these things that we know nothing about, particularly Barcelona's economic situation moving forward. We know nothing about so much of it. So we have been staying away from current events, but we're at a point now where there are things happening at the club that need to be discussed. And particularly we're talking about the board, but if you want to hear a little bit of Dan's voice, then definitely tune into the next about three minutes or so, because before we get to talking about Josep Bartomeu and some of the current events currently, and by that I mean what's happening this week alone, I would just want to break down where the club has been since the new year began. And Sam Marsden, the ESPN Barcelona writer, had a terrific Twitter thread on this. So I quickly want to go through some of the events and we'll see where the club is at at the moment. So to begin the new year, they lost to Espanyol and lost to Atletico Madrid in the Supercopa semis in Saudi Arabia and all that that we'll say bag as it comes with playing in Saudi Arabia. Then before replacing Ernesto Valverde, it became public that the team wanted Xavi. This just as Luis Suarez was ruled out for basically the end of the season at that point. Valverde is let go. Kike Setien is brought in, but not the first choice. And he's the replacement, clearly after Xavi and Ronald Koeman and maybe one or two other guys that we didn't even know about. Barca then squeak by Ibiza in stoppage time, a third division team, then lose to Valencia in the Liga and, and lose to Athletic Club in the Copa del Rey. They fail to sign anyone in January, but they do loan out Carlos Alenia. Todibo is sent to Schalke in that awful deal that could only work out for Barca because of the global crisis, and, and Carlos Perez is sold. Usmane Dembele is then ruled out for the rest of the season after the window closes, and those players are already sent out. Messi and Abidal then take public shots at each other on Instagram when Abidal hints that the players had a hand in Valverde's dismissal. Then we get to the I3 Ventures scandal, which we'll get back to and be talking about a lot in this show. Then... Martin Braithwaite is signed from Leganes due to the league rule, and Leganes is left with nothing, and Barca kind of do look like the bullies of the Liga. They draw 1-1 with Napoli as the virus is beginning to take hold in Italy, then lose 2-0 to Real Madrid in El Clasico before beating Real Sociedad 1-0. Football is then shut down due to the coronavirus. The player pay cut claim is leaked to the media. Players respond in unison about wanting to take the 70% pay cut and pay for non-sporting staff salaries. Then Bartomeu asks four board members for their resignations due to the infighting. Six instead resign, citing a lack of faith in the club's mismanagement and the I3 venture scandal. Emil Roussad then resigns and makes the claim that someone at the club was taking money out of the club in relation to the I3 venture scandal. Then three other board members are reportedly considering resigning as well. So by the time you have this in your ears, maybe they resigned, maybe they did. Messi then denies that he could move to Inter Milan. And then those... Last four things here, just happening in about the last week and a half. So, Frances, after having that all laid out for you, we are just in the middle of April, so three and a half months into the new year. That does not sound like Mescan Club to me. Oh, no, certainly doesn't. It sounds like more than a mess to me. Um, it is just flabbergasting that someone managing a club of Barca's caliber can actually be doing such a terrible job in front. I want to do. I do want to say that I don't sort of, think about Bartomeu personally. I've got nothing against the guy. I mean, I don't know him, but he's just someone who is managing the club on this way, doing sort of, with this trajectory, making all of these mistakes along the way and then basically forgetting about what the club actually is and and stands for and has been standing for for many, many years is just unacceptable. Um, I am not sure whether whoever wants to be a candidate in the next election would be any better. But what I I am certain about is that this does not relate to the Mescon Club philosophy that we've got. And certainly not even that, just not. It's not a a proper way of running any sporting organization or any business for that matter. 
And the reason Bartomeu comes up so much and gets the ire of the media is because he is the president and the vice president. He's his own right-hand man. So, so much of it does get pinned on Bartomeu. And when you speak about about keeping apolitical in this kind of thing, I think we run into the fact that, again, there is no opposition to be speaking about because Bartomeu won re-election back in 2015 after taking over for Sandro Rizal, and it is his job to lose. And because he's not going to be repeating, I, I think a lot of the decision that this board is making, and you can clearly see, again, it's not just Bartomeu, but it's a it's a regime. It's the ones that have been taken hold, and Bartomeu does, ha- does have a lot of power in the people that he's put in those positions. And there's a feeling that this club, and we've talked, we've spoken in previous months that, like any politicians, that's what the, these people are. They're businessmen and women, but of course they are politicians as well. And they tend to think of the moment and the forthcoming moment and the one right in front of their face and the matches and the trophies need to be won, the money that needs to be made right now. And very often these power players wind up having to miss out on this grander picture that they might not be at the club for when it's finished. And when it comes to some of the other projects like Espy Barca, those are the things that are going to be their legacy more than it is the sporting project that could change so much from year to year. And the other caveat I want to add on to the end of that is that social media changes our perception of these boards as well in that because in Catalonia in particular, the way that the press kind of covers Barcelona, it can either be a, a, a situation where and Mundo Deportivo is often accused of being connected to the club and giving the club favorable interviews and favorable press coverage. And so what's coming out of Mundo Deportivo, you look at with one light and then you might hear something from Cat Radio or another news outlet and the story might be completely different or feel like the story that you're seeing on Twitter or social media is almost an international take that it's been vetted through this meat grinder of the 18 to 21 year old people on Twitter that are taking this news and processing it without understanding any of the legality and actually understanding what the real issues are here. Because, Frances, if we just asked uh, somebody without, I, even myself, if you quizzed me on what happened with that I3 Venture scandal without my notes, I would not be able to explain to you what truly is the issue other than what seems to be the blanket problem that there was a smear campaign about the biggest players. But I guess that little headline there is enough to be quite damning. Of course. And also we need to, as you sort of hinted as well, we live in a, in a world of fake news. Uh, there are a lot of realistic news out there that are based on facts. And um, as you can, as you very clearly explained, those facts can, along the way, and especially when you're going from Catalan to Spanish to English or whatever other language, then things can get lost in translation. Um, with the I3 Ventures, which you know in, in Catalonia is called Barca Gate, it's something that we don't really know about yet. You know, um, there was a report on Sport a couple of days back and um, I'm sure you got all the notes in there, but basically they were saying that they were paying excessive amounts of money for jobs that, when I say excessive, it's like 10 or 15 times the, the, the amount of money that you should have been paying f- uh, for this, for monitoring of social media accounts for the Barca first team, but even La Masia, Barca B, and, and younger players, which I don't quite understand why they even need to do that, but whatever, I'm not, I'm not the expert in social media, clearly. But playing distortion amounts for something that should just be fairly easy, fairly straightforward. Also, outsourcing, and you know, I'm, I'm sure we've got some listeners from Uruguay, but to be honest, that is not a job that someone in Uruguay has to do for t- 10 times the price. Someone in Spain, there's many companies could have done that as well. And um, without all the information being published in a sort of, say, in a, by a judge or being in front of the court. So basically going on what Sport and Mundo Deportivo and Catalonia Radio are reporting, it's just, as I said before, it looks like an absolute mess and that Barca chose, Barca, well, not Barca as a club, but Bartomeu as being the person in charge of Barca and uh, some people in his uh, board of directors chose to spend money unnecessarily on very dodgy grounds. Well, yeah, and what's, Bartomeu's role in this is what is most interesting because... At present time, and I think you just kind of have to trust his word for it at the moment, Bartomeu rescinded the contract with the company and said he doesn't know anything related to this scandal and then ordered an external audit. And this is what we're speaking about of the information that we do know. It's an ongoing external audit to investigate what had happened. Now, Frances hinted at a lot of those different pieces. So I want to, again, just run through some of the issues with this I3 Ventures and why we're calling it a scandal and Barca Gate in the way that it's being described. So Price Waterhouse Coops, or PWC, is the organization that is doing the 
audit of the scandal. So it's, it's a different company there that's doing the audit of the scandal. It's not Bartome or some kind of authorities. It has already been leaked that the, the deal with i3 Ventures was too expensive and invoices were destroyed. So again, there's another headline there. The audit is on hold until the end of this global crisis ends. So we really honestly won't know the information that is almost necessary to make decisions about how to move forward at the club until everything is over. The audit has already, however, revealed that i3 Ventures charged way too much based on market value. Digital consultancy companies should be charging 120,000 euros to 150,000. Barca, however, paid 980,000 euros, so close to a million euros instead. Frances also mentioned about the Uruguayan connection. i3 Ventures is a Uruguayan-based company with a not-so-great reputation. And the really big key here is that bank anonymity is allowed in Uruguay in a way that is not in Spain. So if you catch my drift, that is why things seem so nefarious there. The invoice that Frances was referencing, the invoices for payment to this company at 198,000 euros, which is just below the 2,000 euro mark, where they would need to be passed by the control commission and reviewed by the board. So again, that it's another thing that seems nefarious because why would you be just 2,000 euros underneath what needed to be looked at and controlled and voted on by the board? So one of those invoices as well had been ripped into five parts, apparently to avoid being seen by an adjudication committee. Again, uh, one of those things that we don't know the complete information, but it seems like some of the information that's being leaked is that there was it, whoever was involved in this scandal. Again, it's not necessarily it's not necessarily Bartomeu, but whoever at the club was involved in this seemingly knew that what they were doing wasn't so great. Then the contracts that came from five different companies related to i3 Ventures, with everything on those, looked exactly identical, uh, with a lot of the same wording and a lot of the same figures. So having those contracts be almost exactly the same. Again, it seems like there is something going on where i3 Ventures might have a hand in some of those different companies. And I'm not going to say that's insider trading, but it does have something to do with being connected to things that you shouldn't be connected to. So that's all the different things going on there. As far as the other legal ramifications of this, this is part two, is that Barca is at the moment considering legal action against the aforementioned Emil Roussad, the Barca director who, who was one of the Barca directors that resigned for the accusation that an executive, so not a board member, was taking money through the deal with i3 Ventures after Roussard said that he thought that someone at the club had his, basically had his hand in the cookie jar. The board members that resigned then called for the club to accelerate elections to this summer. Again, they were supposed to happen in 2021, depending on the global pandemic being under control. Bartomeu would not be able to run because he has already served two terms. So again, this is not about Jose Maria Bartomeu. But the biggest question is obviously the financial repercussions of the global crisis being the biggest priority at the moment. So uh, Francis, after hearing all of that, again, what cannot be denied is that there was a scandal. There was things that were going on at Barcelona that were underhanded. It does remind me a lot of when Neymar officially showed up from Santos. And because of all the goals he scored and because of the star he became at Barca, we do kind of forget all the negative things that were going on in that deal with Neymar. And this seems to be like that, but it's way worse. And what I also don't understand, even after reading all of that, I don't understand other than maybe getting a favorable press for the for Barca the club over players, which doesn't ever really make sense. I don't understand what the long game here was. No, there, there's a lot of loose ends. Um, the the reference you make to the Neymar transfer is obviously uh, very is the most similar thing in the last I would say ten years that we've got to to what is happening now. Um, obviously, that went to the courts, and to be honest, it's still pretty much ongoing. Um, and until everything is finalized, um, we're not really going to know for a fact what happened. Um, uh, we haven't mentioned on this podcast, I'm assuming most people listening do know, but obviously Bartomeu was the vice president of Sandro Roussel, who became, uh, who was at the same time the vice president for Joan Laporta at the time. Uh, then Laporta and Roussel basically fell out uh, for, for, I would say, private reasons that we don't, we're never really going to find out. But they fell out, they ended up going against each other. Sandro Roussel became president. And then when Roussel was involved in all the Neymar controversy, etc., he was jailed. Um, and then Bartomeu took over the club. And, you know, fast forward to, to what we're experiencing today. Um, obviously, we are not in no way, shape or form in the podcast accusing anyone or anything. We're just reporting and, and, and sort of sharing information that is readily available via Catalan media and obviously, by extension, worldwide media. Um, the You explain everything really well. I'm not going to add too much on that. 
just to say that Rousseau was what in Catalan we call al delfi, which is in Spanish el, el, el delfin, in English the dolphin. Um, that is a, a Catalan phrase that refers to the one that's under someone's wing. So um, the, the, the plan all along um, was that Bartomeu was sort of educating Rousseau into what being a Barca president was. And uh, he was, amongst all of his board members, his preferred choice to take over from him in the summer of 2021. And obviously, that's not going to happen because obviously he's, Rousseau has, has resigned and he's not saying, you know, too many great things about Bartomeu. So, so that, that ship certainly for him has sailed. Um, and the last point I'll make at this point is to say that the this Catalan media gossip, Catalan media reporting of, um, of the situation, they are saying that the main reason that Bartomeu is not uh, running away now, in a way quitting, right now is because he's got some loose ends to to fit together, uh, some bits and pieces to tidy up before he can go. And he cannot do that right now, especially with all the pandemic that we're experiencing, which is why, even though he probably may not want to deep down, um, he has to stay for another year so to save his own, let's say, reputation. Yeah, Frances, as you were saying, so for Bartomeu, he is kind of, whether or not he would even want to continue, he's kind of stuck in that that leadership role as president of Barcelona for probably at least another year because of what the financial repercussions that we mentioned of the global crisis going on, that you want to, the, the same steady hand to be in charge of the club during this time. And not to say that they got him in this mess, so they have to get it out. That's not what I'm saying at all. But I am merely saying that having that stable hand to be able to guide the club, having an understanding of the situation the club is at, as much as mismanagement has already occurred, you don't really want to completely shake things up in the most unlikely time. Now, I, I do want to mention that for Bartomeu, there have been 40 resignations in total from the club since 2000. So actually seeing the number of board members resign, it is odd to see that number of board members resign at one time. So six and maybe more all happening within a matter of about a week and a half. That in itself is a scandal within the club. Because Gaspar, Juan Gaspar, who I have a story about him as well, Gaspar from 2000 to 03. Not only did he resign himself, but he had 10 resignations due to mismanagement and poor results that occurred within the club on that board as well. Laporta from 03 to 2010. Again, Laporta has a few detractors, but largely because of what he meant to the club, he and all the winning that had to do, maybe not with him as much as it did, but Giristain and Ferran Soriano, who actually was one of the 15 resignations under Laporta. There were a lot of guys, even you have to credit Sander Rosell or Bartomeu behind the scenes because they were also on the board with Laporta. And if you remember, Rosell and Bartomeu, as you alluded to, they kind of did fall out with Laporta. So they wound up resigning during the time. So they go almost against his record as, as, as members of the club that resigned. Again, Ferran Soriano, as we mentioned. And then Mark Ingla as well, one of the key figures behind the scenes for Laporta from 03 to 2010. So resignations were still happening uh, at the time. And then Rizal, as we mentioned, 2010 to 14, resigns himself. And then Bartomeu, having won the election in 2015, already has 12 resignations, as we mentioned, and counting six of them coming last Thursday. So... It's not that board members resigning, It's it, think of it like a job, and it, it is one of the greatest jobs I think that anybody would want to have, but also it's a business, and it's a job that it's not surprising when p powerful people, particularly those in business, wind up falling out with each other and having different visions of things. So those kind of resignations, don't think that that in a vacuum is the worst thing. It happens at the club, and things are shaken up. But one of the big things, Frances, I want you to respond to is as I got thinking about why board members would have gone away from Laporta, and one of the arguments for Laporta was that he was, not that he was spending money willy-nilly, but his decisions on where to spend money and his willingness to just kind of throw money out there without a, a greater picture of where the, the club's economic sense was going to be in the future, he certainly, I think, gets a little bit of a pass because of what he meant to Catalonia and the ways in which that he wanted to connect Barcelona with their Catalan identity. Uh, and I think that always kind of goes in the feather of his hat. But I think a lot of it does also have to do with the fact that Pep Guardiola is somebody who, that is pro-Catalan independence. He is so pro-Catalonia and putting that out into the world that I, I think he wound up being the mouthpiece for Laporta, even in Laporta himself. Yeah, that there's spot on there. Uh, Guardiola was, um, as he probably called himself at the time, uh, el, el paracaídas, uh, the, the parachute, the, the, the umbrella, you know. Uh, he had to be, at times, he had to be the manager 
He had to be the coach. He had to be the press director. He had to be the president. He had to be the vice president. Sometimes he had to be the sporting director as well. And and, and basically Guardiola was everything at Barca, you know, because he was the only one that managed to speak up. Like if you remember when we were playing Real Madrid under Mourinho in the Champions League semifinals, nobody from the board says anything. Uh, none of the players say anything. And then he goes in the Bernabeu and he starts calling Mourinho el puto amo. Um, I'm not going to translate that into English because otherwise the, the podcast would be would be banned off iTunes. But, you know, some some not very nice words. And, um, yeah, so so Guardiola was everything. And also, he was incredibly successful. Um, he was brought to the first team, and even to Wasabi, to be honest, the year, the year before that, by Laporta. Uh, Laporta was friends with Johan Cruyff, who, as we spoke about in our top 50 um, and, and the other programs in the last couple of weeks, he's everything at Barca. He is the philosophy, he is the ethos, he is the transformer, he is the, he is the engine behind Barca's success over the last 20, 30 years. And Laporta brought Cruyff back and obviously he hadn't been in symphony with the, with the boards before Laporta at the time. He promoted Guardiola, uh, which was a masterstroke. Guardiola then, um, obviously, huge believer on La Masia. You've got a huge generation of great players that were enabled to, to succeed, but then younger La Masia players that had been promoted by Van Gaal uh, and even Reinhardt um, sort of nurturing them on, which mainly was Xavi and, and Puyol and, you know, Gabri, etc., but mainly those two. And there was a golden generation there. Laporta got um, a lot of signings spot on. For example, Ronaldinho, Dani Alves, etc., um, Samuel Eto as well, and and yeah, the, the the team was just fantastic. And you know, we have been talking about you know businessman, politician, uh, all sorts, but Barca is a football club, and and the vast majority of of fans don't really care about finances, don't really care about politics. Obviously, when it's a a, a club of the size of Barca, in terms of importance and caliber, then people pay attention to that. But ultimately, it's a football club. And if the football club is winning, um, even though that Laporta, I know I know from my contacts in Barcelona, was spending a lot of money on, let's just say, unnecessary things that, that, that didn't need to be spent on, uh, people don't really necessarily care. Um, Ten years have gone by, and all people remember is that Guardiola was brought by Laporta and there was a lot of winning going on. And um, to make Laporta look even better, you then sort of comparing those golden times with what we've got today, which you started the program with for those three tragic minutes. And it's crystal clear what people are going to believe, isn't it? And you know what's interesting, too, when you mentioned talking about Laporta there, is that it's, it's not to say that there's this alternate reality and that, you know, it's a great American poet, Robert Frost says that the road's diverging in the wood. Uh, and I took the one less travels by. And I always think about that when I think about what could have been, right? When you mentioned about Laporta, completely nails, obviously, the Ronaldinho signing, even though Pep doesn't want to use Ronaldinho. So as much as that Ronaldinho signing hit, the original choice was David Beckham. So you asked, what if David Beckham winds up choosing Barcelona, uh, wind up shooting Barcelona over Real Madrid, and maybe things go a little differently. In the same way that Laporta, you're right, Francis, that he was he wanted Pep Guardiola, and he wanted Pep Guardiola so much that they wanted Ricard to resign midway through his final season, and then Bajiristain and some of the other members, I believe Soriano was another one of the ones that said, no, 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 let's wait until the summer, and then appoint Pep Guardiola over the summer. And we also know that Mourinho was one of the key factors mm-hmm. in it. But one of the mm-hmm. reasons why Mourinho, I think, hates Barca so much is because he understands that it was always going to be Pep Guardiola. But again, that didn't necessarily have to do so much with Laporta as it did Bajiristain and Soriana and other players behind the scenes really pushing for Guardiola. So all that said is Laporta, there were these key moments that he could have severely got it wrong because if he puts that Barca B manager, Guardiola, in, in place of Rijkaard halfway through that final season that Rijkaard had, because again, Rijkaard, it seemed like he was done. He was already a lame duck manager at the time, even though he had won a Champions League, and yet Laporta was pushing for it, and that might have been the wrong decision, right? Because you think about when he has that negative result against Nemancia, then losing the second match, it's this feeling that the Catalan media, they were out. They were out on this Barcelona B manager. There were all these big names that Barca could have got, and obviously the, the, the board wasn't rash and fired him after two two rounds, but let's say he comes in in play with that 
you know, the final season of Reichardt halfway through and winds up not getting results. And that's it for Pep Guardiola. It's just these is what ifs that happen. And Laporta's obviously the amount of winning that was done because the decisions got they got it right. And under this Bartomeu regime, and the first few years, when you talk about Ter Stegen, Luis Suarez, Neymar, particularly just player acquisition, and Rakitic even, uh, when he was acquired, they got it so right. I watched the Bayern Munich versus Barcelona Lona match from the treble winning season, and Barca were doing a lot of the same things they do today and that Messi was dropping back. But little things that you saw was that Suarez had much more mobility. Obviously, Neymar had a, he had a role to play in, in that match. Jordi Alba it, it was much more mobile. Rakitic looked like an entirely different player. I, and I really was thinking about how Rakitic in that World Cup year where he played 72 total matches, that player is not the same one that he was before that time when Valverde and then the World Cup just ran him into the ground and he just looks older now. Busquets had a little more mobility, but I think generally actually looked the same. But you even think then up to that point, his ability, that being Bartomeu, and even Roselle, building on what he has built, the squad looked more more complete, and it looked like a squad that uh, they had done they had done it properly. And it's tough to end a cycle when you talk about older players that needed to be moved on, and they got the timeline completely wrong. And that is really what Bartomeu's regime on social media and the people that don't care about the money that is what the Bartomeu regime is answering to. Yeah, no, I, I agree with you hundred percent. I think the important point here is to know where we come from so we don't make the same mistakes in the future. Yeah. Uh, another one of quick things I just wanted to add, too, is on that what-if thing, is that Juan Gaspar, his board, obviously he resigned himself, was not covered in glory either. They were very, very close. And this is credit to Graham Hunter's book about uh, Barcelona as the, making the greatest team. They almost bottled bringing Messi to the club from the start, if not for the efforts of guys who were completely forgotten about in Barcelona history, in Josep Maria Minguea, Charlie Wuschak, who we've spoken about before, but that's him as an advisor to the president, not him as a player, and Juan La Cueva. And those three in particular, I think I might have a YouTube video, we might talk it on a future podcast. Those three play a vital role and almost put their necks out to get this kid messy, this, this teenager who's just too small, to get him to Barcelona because those three in particular believed in him in a way that, that Gaspar, and maybe not even Gaspar, but his board did not believe in this kid. And there were members of the club who were fighting back against it. And you want to talk about one of the greatest what ifs ever. I, that's, that's a what if that could affect any board that's had any any position of power for Barcelona in the last 15, 20 years would be affected by those decisions that were made about Messi. So again, what if is so important? And, uh, you know, the difference between Laporta and Bartomeu's regimes were so minute because of the little decisions that were made. Even one that was made during Laporta's time to send Messi or Andres Iniesta out on loan to Rangers in Scotland. Thankfully, they didn't go. But my goodness, what if they did go and that loan doesn't work out, right? There's so many little things that wind up going right for certain regimes and we remember it fondly. And then when a regime, just things don't work out. Again, what if Neymar doesn't leave? I always ask that question. What if Neymar didn't leave? Where would the club be today? Well, that's those are very good questions. I don't think we've got time to answer either. Um, sort of quickly, Rangers win the Champions League three times in a row. <laughs> Neymar ends up Killing Messi in the showers. How about that? Uh, that's a little dark here. So actually, I'm going to <laughs> flip things around and we'll end this show by talking about, again, this is we're, we're trying to be as apolitical as possible here, but everybody knows there's a presidential candidate, Victor Font. He has a platform called Yes to the Future. So there is a lot of positivity there. And as I always want to remind anybody with politicians, that it's a lot easier to be a, the positive candidate when you're the one outside. And that is what Victor Font is. He's the one coming in saying that, and what he's saying, there's truth to a lot of the things that he's saying with his Yes to the Future platform. He will not ask for the resignations due to the current situation, again, which is a good political gamble to say that, you know, I don't want to force what's happening at Barcelona. I think things should play out. However, he does mention, and these are all, quote, club at risk, quote, institutional shame, and quote, board without authority or credibility. He also said that this is the one that's been the buzz term so far, perfect storm, that it has been a perfect storm of Barcelona needing to financially renew the squad, obviously make it younger and quicker and all those things that Frances and I have been speaking about for it feels like years now. The construction of a spy Barcelona and that big project that is already ongoing, but even what it's going to take to finish that project. 
Winning trophies is still paramount and super important, the most important thing, especially at the tail end of Messi's career, and then not jeopardizing the club's model of Meske on club, which is the one that I think is going to be the most hotly debated when you really get to different candidates speaking about where the future of this club is. It's always the, the model of Meske and club and what that truly means that winds up getting debated the most. Font's background is that he's a businessman from Valladolid, but he wants the club to be transparent with the economic situation and its debt. He does consider himself almost an adopted Catalan, and he runs on that kind of platform. That's why you see his relationship with Xavi, it appears, in the, the way that Puyol has spoken about him in the past. And he is also speaking about being more careful with buying and selling players. So he's gone through a lot of different things there as far as being more careful with buying and selling players. And again, he can say those things, but there really, really is no key answer forward unless you have leverage in those negotiations. And Barca found a way to lose that leverage. And I don't know how they get that back. But one of the ways that they had leverage under the Pep Guardiola regime is that it was so easy to promise that you were going to win. It was so easy to promise that you could play with Xavi, Iniesta, and Messi and all those things. So maybe you don't get that leverage back until you have players who are pining to play for Xavi or pining to, to play for to play with somebody. And again, the attraction of Messi seems to have faded and dulled a bit in recent seasons. But uh, Francesca, I, I just want to make a mention again that you said that the economic situation is one that the fans don't worry about. But I wonder after this global crisis if the fans aren't going to have a little more of an eye on paying attention to really who has a plan and aren't just saying something in the abstract, but really have a plan about the economic situation moving forward for the club because that directly affects the players that are, they're able to buy. Of course, of course. And the, the ones casting the vote, the socios, the socies, the uh, club members, the, the ones with the you know, ticket holders, um, they obviously do care about the finances because they, they vote on them year on year. Let's not forget that Barca is not owned by some multimillionaire from God knows which country. It is run by the Saucis. So it is, um, in a way, it's a democracy because the, the president is elected by the votes that the Saucis have. Um, obviously, I know that many listeners to the podcast would like to be Saucis themselves, but they just cannot because this, this board of Bartomeu and previously Roussel, they did all they could to ensure that the, the rules to become a Saucis themselves became much more strict in the sense that you have to go to Barcelona, I think it's three times a year to sign that you're still interested on, on being a socio. And, you know, if you're from the United States, for example, or you're just not in Barcelona three times a year, then it's really difficult to do, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, as we said, I think it was last week, I just want to reinforce because the topic ha sort of has come up again. I don't personally endorse anybody. I don't think Dan does either. Uh, Victor Fon seems to be the, the, the candidate that, you know, has thrown his... Since he's, he's had into the ring in a way first or with more power. Uh, Joan Laporta, I think he wants to run for presidency again. Um, obviously, he was successful, then he was taken out, and then he was sort of applying to be the president again. He wasn't voted in. Uh, the, the fans actually voted Bartomeu, one well, of the fans, the Saucis, voted Bartomeu um, ahead of Laporta last time. It is very likely Laporta is going to go forward again. Um, with his candidacy. Um, Victor Fon clearly has already... He's the one that's in the media the most these days, basically. And uh, I'm pretty sure that Benedito is going to have another go as well if his finances allow him. Um, long story cut short, I think that whoever uh, succeeds Bartomeu, because obviously he's not going to go... He's not, not able to run for president again. And uh, if Rousseau, who was his Delphine, who was his second in command, or his hidden candidate... Um, obviously has resigned, that's not going to happen anytime soon. Then the continuista candidate, so the, the candidate for continuation isn't very clear. That gives, in my eyes, Victor Fon and Joan Laporta um, uh, sort of free reign to fight each other for, for, for taking over. Um, I would say that Joan Laporta obviously already had a go, and there's a good number of socios who didn't um, agree with the way that he was doing things, particularly by the end. Personally, I don't know enough about Victor Font to say whether he should be president or not. Um, what I do know is what Xavi said in an interview recently, that Victor Font is his friend. And uh, if he's friends with Xavi, he's very likely going to be friends with Puyol as well. And uh, when you've got those two lined up, you're most likely going to have also Jordi Cruyff. Uh, Jordi Cruyff, obviously the son of Johan Cruyff, who's been uh, manager in many clubs around the world, um, particularly Greece, etc., but, you know, not, not in the main leagues, but mainly in the sort of secondary European leagues. And also he's been sporting director. Um, I'm assuming Oscar Garcia is there somewhere as well. And 
with Oscar, it will be his brother Jofra. Um, they're both um, coaching together as well. So there's a lot of um, sort of, how can I call it, early 2000s and late 1990s La Masia greats, Xavi Puyol, etc., that would be connected with either one of the candidates moving forward. And it seems to be that Victor Fon is going to be the one that they're going to be running with. Um, but then again, I know nothing. <laughs> nothing is on paper. I don't know what's going on behind the scenes. And um, it is all a speculation based on what the Catalan radio and the Catalan media are saying at this moment in time. Yeah, right. I, and I think the, the important thing here is to recognize how these elections at Barcelona very often do play out. They wind up being whatever the regime is, as much as uh, Jose Maria Bartomeu is born and raised in Catalonia. He's Catalan. And yet it seems to me that, again, this is an apolitical take. We're not talking about independence or any of those kind of things. What we're just merely speaking about is that by the end of a regime, and I think in particular the current regime, as Barcelona has become this global club, the the vote and the platforms that these candidates are running on winds up being a we need to get this club back to its roots of Mescaen club of being about Barca. So what's most helpful to that is having former La Masia players and figures that are, are important that have name cachet around the club to to have them have a hand and support you wind up going winds up going a long, long way. And it, it kind of says that it, it does. It does. They make it about to, to remind you that this is a club in Catalonia. We're not talking about politics beyond the club. We're talking about within the club. They say we need to get back to who we are and what we are and almost go back to what Juan Gamper was. Because, again, the world that Juan Gamper being the, I think, still the most legendary president that Barcelona has ever had. And we regressed if we didn't mention his name when we speak about the Barcelona presidency, because he really did build the model and create the club at the Barcelona, as we know it, that created, he wasn't even the first president. He wasn't old enough when he helped found the club. And, but then he grew into that role. And obviously the way his life was cut short is because his love for the club just didn't correspond with the, the lack of support from the Spanish government. And that is the simplest way I can put that, obviously. But yeah, with Gamper, trying to get back to this model of what Barcelona is, it's difficult because the global world that Barcelona are now trying to accommodate and those fans, including myself, those fans that they're trying to accommodate, it, it does kind of, it, it's a juxtaposition of what the club has always been to the region of Catalonia and the people that have always spoken up for the club, I think most successfully. So the platforms that are trying to run that Mescaen club model is trying to say, let's get back to who we are. Sure. But the world that is around Barcelona isn't the one that Mescaen club was kind of built for. Does that, does that make any sense that it, it's, we were almost changing Mescaen club. The definition of it doesn't change, but what it means to the outside world obviously has to change because well, Francisco Franco isn't in charge anymore. You know, you don't have a Spanish civil war going on. So obviously, and even Mescaen Club, that adage what didn't exist in Gamper's time. It didn't exist during the Spanish civil war. It is still actually a recent decades that that has become the adage of the club. So I just want to make sure that we're not really, we're, we're not simplifying things, that this is a nuanced discussion. And so I would take the time to listen to each platform from each candidate, because I, I think where the club is going in the future continues to be quite complicated, not only with a global pandemic, but the global audience that they're trying to reach. Yeah, without a doubt. I think that Mescon Club has to be something that is not just in the inside of the shirt or the top bar of the, you know, by, by, by your neck on a T-shirt. It's not something that's on the stadium, sort of around the seats uh, on a beautiful, pretty pattern. It is something that the club represents. It is something that the club lives on a day-to-day -day basis. And unfortunately, that just hasn't happened for, I would say, a good number of years now. So, Frances, I think you can hear the wind here in the United States howling outside. I don't know if that means that it's the winds of change coming for Barcelona. But as we said, it's going to be a little bit of time now before things change. Because, again, there is still the looming global crisis that is going over all of football. It's not just Barcelona. We expect that financially Barcelona will get through this just fine. But I, I think the transfer window and all of the club's finances, I, I, as I said, I was going to, we are actually going to have a whole show on their finances, but we have no idea where that is going. So we're almost going to have to hit the reset button on that and revisit that in whether it's weeks, whether it's months, nobody knows. So I think that's a good place to leave it, Frances. It was a lot of us kind of speaking about what's happening in the news and kind of making generic statements, but I think we explained it well. And Frances, again, thanks so much for the help that you give by not only listening to Catalan Radio in a way that I can't, but analyzing and processing with your background. 
Of course, likewise. I, I love the way that you research different bits and pieces so that I don't have to remember anything. <laughs> <laughs> well, I do want to remind all of our listeners to remember to not only thank them for tuning in, but to remember to remind them to tap in their app and check out the show notes to subscribe. You can also find us on social media. We're on Twitter at the Barcelona Pod or at Hilton D13 for me on Instagram at the Barcelona Pod. Closed Facebook group is tbpod.link backslash group. Deeper dives and discussions that will con- that have continued on during this time of crisis. You can also help us out on Patreon to continue making these shows at tbpod.link backslash Patreon. Again, I cannot say thank you enough to the Patreons, not only the new ones that have joined in this time to support the show. And as Frances has kind of alluded to, he doesn't need to say anything more now, but has also supported me. That has been a great help. Again, I do work in sports, so things are a little bit different and i do appreciate them there you can also support us again with no money no patreon whatever just go on youtube hit that subscription button i see the numbers so i know that if everyone listened to the pod went and subscribed on youtube that would help to hit some landmarks there and make that youtube show a little more popular again it all kind of works together there's a lot of synergy here you know not unlike what's happening with the board of barcelona but there's a lot of things that work in tandem behind the scenes together so check us out there hit that subscription button but as always, if this is all you want to do is listen to the show, we really, really do appreciate it, particularly in a time when there's no football. So thanks so much for listening to Barcelona Podcast. Until next time, we'll talk to you soon. Forza Barca. Forza.